This is the coast of Cadiz. This is a hippos, a ship from Phoenician times. And this is a modern freezer vessel. Japanese. Yes, Japanese. Although they're from different times, they've both come to the Strait of Gibraltar, which is more than a little bit out of their way. Why? For the same reason we make all our videos. Tuna. The Japanese freezer ship buys tuna and transports it more than 11,000 kilometers around the globe so it can be consumed as a luxury product. And at the same time, at the fishmongers in Cadiz, the price of tuna goes up. You're probably thinking, well, that's globalization. And it all feels very modern. But if we take a look back, it turns out this has happened before. Here, on the coast of Cadiz, another civilization from the east came to convert tuna into a global product. The Mongols. No, the Phoenicians, way back in the first century after Buddha, or the sixth century before Christ. The Phoenicians came from the east. Okay, not as far east as Japan, but they came from here, from Lebanon. And in the sixth century before Christ, sailing from the Lebanon to Cadiz was like sailing to Japan today. Whether it's the Japanese or the Phoenicians, why sail halfway round the world to reach the Straits of Gibraltar? Wasn't there anything closer? One reason could be tuna. Great shoals of bluefin tuna pass through the Straits of Gibraltar from the Atlantic to breed. In the Strait, there are so many tuna and they're so desperate to mate that they're easy to catch. They swim right into your nets, they jump into your mouth to be eaten, there is more tuna than water! That's why the Japanese come, and it might be why the Phoenicians came too. Look what happens if we superimpose a map of the main areas of Phoenician influence on a map of the Atlantic bluefin tuna migration routes. Coincidence? We know less about the Phoenicians than we would like. Their trade routes spread throughout the Mediterranean, but they left few written records. Although they wrote, they did so on material that didn't last, such as parchment or clay tablets, or on the backs of their hands. Hardly anything has survived. We don't know how they wrote tuna in Phoenician. In fact, we don't even know how they wrote Phoenician in Phoenician. What matters is that they reached Cadiz and they stayed eating the tuna that was a cheap, abundant source of high-quality protein, tuna kilometer zero. Although, to be fair, the tuna have already swum 5,000 kilometers before they get caught, so it's more like tuna kilometer 5,000. And they would have carried on like that if it weren't for the fact that if there's one thing the Phoenicians liked even more than eating tuna, it was indulging in a bit of trade. The Greeks wrote about the Phoenicians, who were their rivals. You know that feeling when you hate somebody but you can't help trading with them and talking about them and writing about them? Well, that. We don't know how it all began. Maybe a Greek tried it and said, What's this stuff the Phoenician brought? It's delicious. I would pay for more of that. And that was where some Phoenician Jeff Bezos spotted an opportunity. Jeff Bezos, in case you don't know, is the owner of Amazon. He's on a salary of $1 a month, and despite that, he owns a rocket. How do you cross the Mediterranean with a boatload of tuna and make sure it arrives in good condition? You have to find some way of preserving it. The Japanese just freeze the tuna on their great big boat, and off they go. But the poor old Phoenicians had to work a bit harder. They salted their tuna and stored it in amphoras. Otherwise, it would have rotten in the heat. We can assume that the Greeks ordered more and more amphoras of tuna. And we can assume that our entrepreneurial Phoenician couldn't keep up with the demand. So, he had no choice but to tell the Greeks that he didn't have any more amphoras or any more tuna. His was a small-scale, sustainable family business. No more trade. Ha! Huh. Right, can you imagine a Phoenician saying no to a business opportunity? The Phoenicians set off for Cadiz and created an industry that Henry Ford would have been proud of. 
and tuna exploded. Amphoras are the archaeological evidence of this trade. Remains have been found in Greece that perfectly match remains found at the other end of the Mediterranean, in Cadiz. Not from the same amphora, from similar ones. They've been found in temples, markets and taverns, and in the houses of the Greek upper classes. And some of them still contain remains of Tiona. Yuck! It was so fashionable that the ancient Greek satires featured wealthy characters eating tuna. The opsophagi. It was desalted and then cooked with oil and herbs, accompanied by the finest wine. There you go. That's it. Some splashes. Nice. A few stains. Okay. More herbs. Yes, very, very nicely illustrated hands. Thanks. Really, no, thank you. No, not at all. We've seen how the relationship between humans and tuna goes back a long way. Preserving tuna and exporting it to the other side of the world wasn't invented by the Japanese. It was the Phoenicians who were the first to globalize a food product that came from the sea. Before the Romans. And way before Amazon. Perhaps... In some post-apocalyptic future, when archaeologists find the sunken remains of a Japanese vessel off the coast of Cadiz, they'll ask, what were they doing so far from home? And the answer, once again, will be tuna.